My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is We have been studying since the first hour on the subject of confessing Christ. This morning earlier we dealt with the definition of this confession. We talked about what it means. It simply means to declare and acknowledge and profess or admit. One confesses when he openly declares that he is convinced that a thing is true. And of course, confession is the opposite of denial or silence. But I want us to just reiterate these three things that we talked about this morning. It's a belief in the heart that a certain thing is true. Number two, it's a decision that one is willing to make an open commitment and let others know. And number three, is a statement acknowledging, professing, or declaring that conviction. You remember, uh, if you're not here, but this one, we looked at Acts chapter 2. Verses 37 and 38, especially verse 37. Peter is preaching on Pentecost. He has talked about Jesus being the one who fulfilled prophecy. He talked about him being, uh, he died, raised, and God appointed him. And then in verse 37, they said, and when they heard this, you remember that? They were pricked in their hearts and said, let's go back again and think about that. When they heard this, what did they hear? They heard that Jesus of Nazareth, the one born of Mary, the one came down from heaven, had lived and died, buried, rose again, and ascended to heaven, and he will come again. And the Bible says, when they heard this, through the other things they heard, they heard that they were the ones responsible for killing Jesus. But they, 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 that, 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 that question or that thought for that matter, when they heard this, something happened inside of them to the point where they have to ask men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, you will see where we're going after a while that it must bring a sense of conviction when one confesses Christ it's because he is convicted it is not just some words you say just to get baptized it's more than that it's a belief Romans 10 9 and 10 with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made what confession what that person believes about Jesus and of course he's talking to the Jews so what is confessing Christ and we mentioned this morning what some say some confessions that are not confession of Christ. For example, some say, well, God for Christ's sake has forgiven me my sin. What confession is that? Now, all that we know about Jesus is found in the New Testament. And the Old Testament, of course. And there's nowhere in the scriptures where he says, God, where someone says, God for Christ's sake has forgiven me my sins in order to be a Christian. It's not found there. Some religious groups expect people to make such a confession before baptism. One group asks people before baptism, have you accepted Jesus as your personal savior? 
Do you believe that God for Christ's sake has forgiven you your sins and you are and you are a new heart? As you see where this came from, Seventh-day Adventist baptism of vow. Other groups require a person to tell an experience. The only person who has experience is a Christian. How would you ask a non-Christian to give you experience of conversion when he is not yet converted? Listen, no Bible passage anywhere teaches anything or anyone to make such a confession or tell such an experience in order to be baptized. The reason is simple. Sins are not forgiven before baptism. We mentioned Acts twenty two sixteen. Remember, Saul of Tarsus spent three days and three nights in Damascus praying. But yet he was not saved. It was at the end of that session, those three days and three nights, that Ananias came to him and he said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Go back to Acts 2, 37, 38. When they were praying in their hearts, they asked a question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said what? Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And of course, Peter take, took them back to Mark 16, 16. And we read 1 Peter 3, 21. Where Peter says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth thou so now save us. Not the putting away the field of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, we know that there is such a thing as confessing sin. But who is to confess sin? You go back to Psalms 51. Who is confessing sin? A child of God. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we, John says, if we, John includes himself as a Christian. If we confess our sins, if we Christians confess our sins, he lets us know that Christian sins and Christian when he sins needs to confess sins. He's not talking to non-Christians. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But no passage teaches that confession of sins is required as a step to salvation. And if people did make such a confession, it would not be sufficient for them to be saved. Now, let's move on a little faster. So now, what confession of Christ is? What really, what is it? Let's consider at this point what it means to confess Christ. What it really means to confess Christ. Then later we will show what, that, that we must confess Christ as a part of conversion in order to be forgiven of sins and become a child of God. Now to confess Christ, it means to confess Jesus as Christ and King. You're acknowledging who he is. Matthew chapter 16. Read at verse 16. He came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He had disciples saying, Whom do men say that I am? And they began to answer, Some say, You are John the Baptist, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Listen to Peter. Peter said, You are the Christ. Notice his answer. Not a Christ. But the Christ, Peter said, you are the one, the anointed one of God, not just any Christ. You are the Messiah. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then listen to Jesus now. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter, where do you get the idea that he is the Christ? From heaven. From heaven, Peter says. Or Christ says. Not. Peter said he was the Christ, the Son of God. Christ, of course, means... The one who is anointed to be king, ruler of God's people. Jesus blessed Peter and said that this truth was revealed from the Father. Now, now just think. 
When a person really confesses Christ and is baptized, that person is blessed with remission of sins. He is blessed with forgiveness when he truly acknowledges who Jesus Christ is. So here he makes what is called the good confession before Pilate. Pilate wants to know who Jesus is. So he asks, are you the king of the Jews? Listen to the answer Christ, came, Christ gave. He said, you say I am. Whatever motivation or whatever motives a, a pilot had, it didn't matter. He said the right thing. Jesus was not going to correct him. For he acknowledged that Jesus was the king of the Jews. In other words, he was saying, it is as you say. King of the Jews? It's a good expression. Why did they use that expression? It was an expression for Christ who descended from David and would be anointed king over Israel. They all saw him as the one to replace David. Unfortunately, they thought it was a physical material kingdom. But we will see that later on. In John 18, 36, Christ would say, My kingdom is not of this world. So he confessed himself to be a spiritual king, the Christ. You remember when in Nath about Nathaniel? In, in John chapter 1 verse 49, Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, the King of Israel. So when people today confess Christ, they must mean that he is the Christ, he is the anointed one, he is the ruler over all mankind, especially God's people. Remember John chapter 4, the story of the woman at the well. Remember her. Now when Christ met her, she had come to draw water at the well. Christ says, hey, could you give me a drink? He says, how come you a Jew asking me a Samaritan for water? The conversation continued for a while. So Jesus Christ began to reveal himself to this woman. First of all, he told the woman, I know you are who you are. You have been married how many times? Now listen to me. This is not used in order to convey how to teach a lesson on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. No. Jesus is trying to tell this woman, I know who you are, in order that the woman might know who is talking to her. We got to be careful about what we use for doctrine. Jesus is simply revealing to her that he knew who she was, that she would understand that he knew her, even though he had never met her. And so she could declare, you indeed are the son of God. You are the one who come. She went back into the city, told the others what she saw, and brought them back, and they began to hear about Jesus. Listen. Sometimes we got to, well not sometimes, but we got to be careful sometimes that we take a passage to, to say what it was not intended to say. Now the doctrine isn't wrong, but use a passage like this to teach a lesson like that is not necessary. There are other plain passages as Matthew 99. Studying the Bible takes effort. It takes skill. And we must use all that God has given us to do so. So, again, not only confess him as ruler, as king, but you confess Jesus as the son of God. This morning we said there is no such thing as a formula. And we have to be careful that we tell, well, you must say, thou art the Christ, or I believe in Jesus Christ, the son of God. That makes it a formula. You ask the question whether they say yes or no is the same as saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. We got to be careful we don't make the church a denomination. There's no, look at all these answers. He is the king of the Jews. He is master. He is the son of God. Matthew 16, 16. Peter said, thou art the Christ. 
the Son of the living God. John 1 49, Nathaniel confessed, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. John eleven twenty seven, 27, Martha confessed, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. John 20, 28, Thomas confessed him to be the Lord and God. Jesus was God in the flesh, the only begotten Son, having all characteristics of deity, unique in his relationship to God. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Go on to verse number 14. And He became Word, became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we behold the Son of God. Listen. So when people confess Jesus today, they should mean that He is the Son of God who partakes of the nature of deity. And one of the problems has been, that includes me, that we have not taught on this as much as we should have taught. We have taught on faith, we have taught on repentance, we have taught on baptism, but we have left our confession. So that's what we're talking about it this morning. To, believe, uh, to confess Christ is to confess him as Savior. John 4, 42, the Samaritans met Jesus. They said they believed that Jesus was indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So if you say, I believe as G in Jesus as a Savior, I believe in Jesus as a Son of God, I believe in Jesus as the ruler, is the same confession. You hear me? It's the same confession. Jesus is the only one who died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. And as a result, all men can have hope of salvation from sin. Without him, there will be no hope. Acts 4 and verse 12, nor the name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved. Romans 10, 9, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I like what Paul says in Philippians 2. We're going to have to confess him here. Now, you don't have to, but it is encouraged that you confess him here, because the time will come when you're going to have to confess him, and that at that time won't do you any good. If you want confessing Christ to do you any good, you have to voluntarily now confess him and then be baptized. Listen, listen. The con uh, Christ should be confessed as Jesus or Jesus as Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 is an interesting passage. Again, look at Romans 10. Begin at verse 1. Here the, the Jews had a problem. They want to go about with their own righteousness. They say, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Well, listen what he says. For I bear them record. For they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, listen now, being ignorance of God, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. Here's a question I have often asked. In this text, what is and who is God's righteousness? Jesus Christ. And the Jews didn't want to acknowledge that. So verses 9 and 10, Paul says, with the heart... Men believe it unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made of salvation. You Jews cannot be Christians if you do not confess Christ. And it is not a formula. You have to believe this in your heart. So they have to believe he is the Son of God, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, that he is God manifested in the flesh. They don't want to acknowledge that. Who wants a Messiah that was born of an unwed mother? Who wants a Messiah that grew up in little Nazareth? That's not your choice, folks. That's how God sent him. Through the town of Nazareth, through Bethany, even Egypt. When Herod got mad and wanted to kill all those boys. 
So Paul says, you, then, then listen to verse number 13 of Romans 10. I like this. This is what he says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So Paul said, listen, you can't even look back to Abraham. You got to listen to us. What we tell you about Jesus, that's what you have to believe. Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? The word of God. So you don't get to Jesus by what you dream and what you feel, but what, by, by what the word of God teaches. There's something you say when you look at Romans chapter 10. Faith is a conviction in the heart. But confession is here listed separately from faith. This confession should be made with the mouth. Every Bible or every Bible example of confession involves something a person says. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 11. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, I want you to know something. I appreciate this audience. It's yet 9 o'clock. We got to get out early because it's a TV program. At 11 o'clock, we got to get out early whenever early is. All right, look at verse 11 of chapter 2. And that, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No choice in the matter. You cannot be a Christian without confessing Christ. It's not possible. Luke 6, 46. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? It does no good to call Jesus Lord and not obey him. Nor is it enough to change our way of living without refusing to confess him. Last week, we dealt on repentance, and that was good. But repentance leads us on to confession. And both of them are required. To confess Jesus as Lord is to make a pledge of allegiance to his authority. Don't we make, don't we say the pledge of allegiance of football games? Showing, now, now, let me pause here a minute. I was born in the island of St. Vincent and the Grandins. I grew up there. I'm a Vincentian by birth. But when I went to the church in Macon, Georgia, to be a citizen, I became a United States citizen. That's what I am. You hear me? I may have a different accent, but I am a proud United States citizen. I've enjoyed the privileges and I continue to enjoy them. When I go home to St. Vincent, I'm a Vincentian. I got to speak the way we speak. But they don't see me. The immigration officer at the airport don't see me as a Vincentian because I have a United States passport. I'm trying to show you something. Being a citizen is important and we're to be proud to be a citizen as we are in this country. The point we're trying to make is this. There is allegiance involved. When you become a citizen of the kingdom of God, you have an allegiance to Christ and Christ alone. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. You got to leave all your denominations behind. They are no longer important. You thank God for the way you were raised. But now you thank God that you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And your life is a confession of Jesus who he is in your life. Lord have mercy. You understand? It's beautiful to have Jesus as your Lord. Listen. 
A person cannot make a scriptural confession if he does not believe in Jesus or if he has not truly repented and determined to obey. As Mr. Farrakhan said one time that he says, we Muslims and Christians are brothers. I say, are you crazy? We're not brothers. Muhammad is your prophet. Jesus is mine. And Jesus is alive and well and Muhammad is dead. You hear me? We are not brethren to the Muslims or any denominational person. We are not brethren. I'm sad to tell you. If you were saved before you were baptized, we are not brethren. Now if you say we are brethren because we are black, fine. But from a Christian perspective, no, not according to the Bible. It's book, chapter, and verse. Nothing more, nothing less. Listen. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Having then a great chief, or a high priest, passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, may we hold fast the profession. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. John 20, 28, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. You know, he didn't believe that Christ rose from the dead. And so Christ says, come on, Thomas. Put your hand through my hands and through my side. When Thomas saw, he said, I don't need to no more. I don't need you. My Lord and my God. When was the last time you said that? When was the last time disaster came into your life and you said, my Lord and my God, even crying sometimes. When was the last time someone died who's close to you and you say, my Lord and my God. You realize who Jesus is despite the circumstances. Because they're there sometimes to help us draw closer to God. So, now when you see conclusions, it don't mean I'm about to end. It just means some statements I'm about to make. That may take a few seconds or a few minutes. So confession of Christ is a statement made with the mouth about Jesus. Since there are some variation in the way confession is worded, we conclude the scripture does not bind one set formula of words. That's what we're saying. Scriptural confession does not consist of reciting a word-for-word -word quotation. For that matter, I challenge you as well at baptism. So we try, we say, it is good to say in the name of the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit, but that's not all you have to say. By the authority of Jesus, we got to be careful now about formulas that make us song and look like denomination. Yes, yes, yes. Let's see. It requires, listen to this, understanding concepts about who Jesus is and then convey, conveying by mouth that we accept these concepts as true. He is the son of God. He is the king of kings. He is our savior. He is our redeemer. All that is true. So when we confess Christ, whatever we say, it involves all of these and more. See, he professes that he believes Jesus to be God's divine son, the anointed ruler of God's people, the savior of the world, and the master whom we all must obey. 
in saying this. One admits that he must live his life in total obedience to his will. This is what we must understand and intend to convey to others by our confession. Have you confessed Jesus to be what the Bible teaches that he is? No, the confession can be done in answer. Listen, listen. In answer to questions. When, some, when should one confess Christ? In a sense, we should confess Christ repeatedly throughout our lives as Christians. But we are discussing the confession required as part of conversion that is becoming a Christian. Surely, this confession must come after one believes and repents. For otherwise, it would not be a true confession. But one must confess Christ as a necessary step in order to be forgiven of sins and become a disciple. All right, go back to Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. One passage says, calling on the name of the Lord. I believe that to be confession. It's an acknowledging who Jesus Christ is, especially his authority. He is the one who can forgive me of my sins when I continue in baptism. He is the only one. So I must acknowledge who he is. Consider this. During his lifetime, a pattern was established that a person must confess him in order to be his disciples. Now, since this occurred before Christ's death, the terms of New Testament uh, 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 were not yet in effect, nor did people enter Jesus' church at the time. Nevertheless, confession was a test. I, got it. I want you to see this. Is it large enough? Confession was a test of who was or was not a disciple. Look at John 1 49 again, Nathaniel. When he first, when he first, when he first believed, confessed Jesus to be the, the Son of God, King of Israel. When he first believed, Romans 10 9, with the heart man, Believes and with the mouth confession is made. John 4 42. The Samaritans, when they first believed, confessed Jesus to be the Savior of the world. John 9. Jesus healed a blind man. Later, when Jesus affirmed that he was the Son of God, the blind man said, I believe. Note that confession occurred in response to Christ's prompting. Matthew 10, 32, 33. Whoever confesses Jesus before men, Jesus will confess before his Father in heaven. So confession of Christ is a condition of fellowship. Confession must continue after one is a disciple. But fellowship cannot begin for those who will not confess. Remember John 12, 42 and 43? Here's an example. Certain Jews believe in Jesus, but they will not confess him. Surely no one would affirm that they were disciples. So confession was a test of discipleship during Christ's lifetime. It stood between discipleship and non-discipleship. The Jews recognized this. For they cast out of the synagogue those who confess Christ. So people confess Christ when they wanted to become disciples. And if people would not confess, they were not disciples even though they believed. I'm trying to say something. So confession was a condition of discipleship. 
So we would expect the pattern to continue. In order to become a Christian, one must first, one first had to confess Christ. And then we go back to Romans 10, 9 and 10. So we find out that confession is a necessary condition to salvation. As Paul told those Romans, confession comes first, then comes salvation. But sins are actually forgiven when people are baptized, not before. According to Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. Let's look at a couple of passages before we close. 1 Timothy 6, 12 and 13. Note what some translation says. Oh yes, here we go. I'm getting it. I'm sorry for those in the room who are looking at me and saying that I'm, I'm messing up. No, I'm not messing up. This is Brother Walker's job here. <laughs> but what we are trying to show you is how important this is. Confessing Christ as Lord, confessing him as Savior, confessing him as our Redeemer, acknowledging who he is. This is necessary for your salvation. But when should this be done? Again, look back at Romans chapter 10. Begin at verse number 13. Confession should be after you have heard. And after you have believed. And according to Luke 33, after you have repented. For you find this, of course, in Acts 2 and verse number 38. Now, if you have not confessed Christ as Lord of your life, if you have not confessed him as a son of God, don't get baptized. Confession comes first. And we are teaching you that it is so important that you have to see who Jesus is. That without him, there is no salvation. Without him, there is no heaven. You have to acknowledge who he is. And once you begin this, it becomes the rest of your life to confess Christ by the way you live. That's when Matthew 10 comes into the picture. So, we looked at Romans chapter 10 and now we are looking at 1 Timothy 6. Lay hold an eternal life to which you were also called and have done what? Confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Uh-oh. The New American Standard says, take hold of eternal life to which you were called and you have made the good confession. The NIV says, take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made the good confession. Timothy made the good confession when he was called to eternal life. Paul is writing to Timothy to urge him to continue fighting the good fight so that he will eventually receive eternal life. What, what is the good confession? 1 Timothy 6, 13. He says this was the same confession that Jesus made before Pilate. When he said, you say that I am. <laughs> listen, listen. As we mentioned Pilate, before Pilate, Jesus acknowledged he was king. Anointed ruler of God's people, the Christ. So when Timothy was called to eternal life, he confessed like Jesus confessed himself before Pilate. Second Timothy, or uh, Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 14. We are called by, for salvation by the gospel. So Timothy was called by the gospel so he could have the hope of eternal life. When Timothy received that call, he responded by confessing the good confession. The time to confess then is when we are called by the gospel. 
That is when you hear the gospel preached. Romans 10 again 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17. Just as confession was a test of discipleship while Christ lived on earth. So confession was a requirement to salvation after his death. Look at Hebrews 10, 22-23. Listen to what he says. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering. Stay with it. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. He is the King of Kings. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and Omega. We have to believe all of that. When we acknowledge who Jesus is. Listen, listen. And finally, Acts chapter 8. We'll stay there for today. The story of the eunuch. Remember, he is coming from one of their feasts, the Jewish feast. He had come to Jerusalem, was returning, reading Isaiah. As he read chapter 53, he found something there that he didn't understand. So he asked Philip, or Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I except some man should guide me? And then the Bible said, Philip, preach unto him Jesus. I don't know how long that sermon was. But I knew that he, they were traveling. And I knew that that was not a five-minute sermon or a ten-minute sermon. It might not even have been an hour sermon. Because when Philip was through, this man understood who Jesus was. So when Philip said, if you believe with all your heart. So Philip must have convinced him, brought him to the point of conviction that he would say, man, what am I supposed to do after this? And Philip would say, you need to get baptized, son. Could you imagine the urgency? As, as, they, as they command the chariot to stand still. Man, I could just see Charlton Heston in that chariot like fire running across the desert. And then he had, to, and then he had commanded the chariot to stand still. That must have been some good break in there. Because water is in front of them. It might be a long time again before they see any more water. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down into the water. After acknowledging who Jesus Christ was, this confession came after his belief and change that would lead to his baptism. What about you this morning? You need to believe in Christ. I don't mean a superficial belief. I believe a belief and acknowledgement that truly I am lost without Jesus. And he is the only one qualified. Not mama, not papa, not my brother, not my sister. But Jesus, the only one qualified to take my sins away. And so man, I acknowledge him. I can say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. I can say that with certainty. With a kind of vigor that I haven't used before. And so be baptized for the remission of my sins as a child of God yes yeah, sometimes we have to do some confession but that confession that we do must be followed with good works must be followed with good works listen carefully listen carefully someone has written that when we would have confessed our sins repent of them 
it's difficult for that same sin to keep, to keep coming back to us again. If that same sin is repeated, something is wrong somewhere. There must be another sin that we are repenting of or confessing for the next week. We need to pray for ourselves. Asking God's guidance in our everyday lives. Before you leave home in the morning, ask God's guidance. When you get back home, thank him for taking you through the day without sin in your life. And by the way, everything don't have to come to church. There are something between you and God, and there are something between you and the person you sin against. Corrected with the person you sin against. Come into church only exposing that the person doesn't even know what's going on. The person you sin against have to hear the same thing that everybody else hearing at the same time. And you're figuring, what happened? Go to the person. The church don't have to come into it unless it is so public that it brought shame on the church. Come to Christ this morning as together we stand and sing. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste, to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the soul.